Good evening, everyone. Uh, it's again a wonderful evening with a uh, webinar uh, of the ESSM on the uh, position statement. And this evening we have a uh, wonderful uh, presentation from uh, Fabio Castiglione from uh, originally Italy, working in London and the uh, first author of this uh, position statement. But before we start, I would like to ask uh, our president, Carlo Metocchi, uh, to give a few words of uh, welcome to everyone. Thank you very much, uh, Kobe, and uh, it's really my pleasure to introduce uh, this uh, very interesting uh, topic today, and especially a very good friend, Fabio. And uh, I'm sure you will enjoy this, uh, this webinar, but uh, I, I want to take a couple of minutes just to give you some, uh, some more infos about uh, uh, our educational programs. So one is this uh, webinar series that uh, is uh, running uh, very close now to the end because we have already done quite a good number of webinars and uh, I have to thank uh, these two gentlemen that have uh, organized and really spent a lot of time on that so both uh, Kobe and Giovanni and so thank you really for both of them to have prepared for our society such a very good uh, scientific uh, product but uh, uh, just want to briefly mention that we are running in updating our uh, books and for us, they are not books, but they are Bibles, because I think they are really a very complete uh, content on sexual medicine and clinical sexology. And uh, I do believe that those books that are available only for ESM members on our website, uh, there will be something that really you need to look after with a lot of effort. And uh, least but not, uh, last but not least, uh, there is the textbook on surgery. Now it's ready. And I think this is another big piece of uh, uh, skills and the knowledge about uh, surgical uh, things. So mainly it's about uh, penal prosthesis and uh, artificial sphincter. But I think that all of this information will be really very good for everybody is interested not only in uh, clinical, but also in surgical things. Um, the next slides is basically just to give you again on the surgical point of view, uh, a, a news about our new born academy on genital surgery and uh, this is a new product that is going to uh, start the next year in 2021 and uh, is a very detailed and well done program and some training uh, for uh, surgical uh, or sur surgeons or, or young surgeons that want to complete their uh, skills and preparation in surgical uh, program and i think that uh, this will be very good uh, if you look after because uh, you really be moved from uh, uh, theoretical points to really uh, a, a fellowship in uh, some excellent centers. So I think it will be very good for everybody who will participate. And uh, <clears throat> again, uh, the videos, <clears throat> we are uh, trying to increase the number of videos in our uh, uh, library because uh, we have already some videos on erectile dysfunction and other topics, but we want to add, uh, and we have already some other videos on surgery and uh, there is some other topics that we want to complete and so again I think all these products are very good to increase your knowledge and uh, scientific preparation. So this is basically all I want to tell you at the moment for our educational programs and I just want that the, the webinar go on so Kobe you can keep going with the preparation and presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Carlo, and for your support and collaboration as the president of the ESSM for all these projects. Uh, thank you, Carlo, for all your support and uh, working with us on all these projects and initi initiating as the president of the ESSM. And I would like to introduce a very important person, uh, too, that involved is our scientific chair, do, which is doing marvelous work in the previous Congress in the preparation of the statement and in the next Congress, Giovanni Corona. So thank you, Kobe, uh, for this kind presentation. Uh, um, I'm still at work now, but I want to be here uh, to support uh, Fabio because I think that uh, we uh, are going to present, I think, one of the first statement on basic science. Uh, so it, it, it took a long uh, time, but uh, as uh, um, Fabio will show you, Fortunately, uh, even this statement have been uh, published uh, uh, and accepted for publication just a few days ago. So I'm really proud about it. Um, just uh, uh, thank uh, um, Fabio and uh, his team for this fantastic work. And obviously thanks to Kobe and Carlo for supporting 
this fantastic uh, uh, work and project. So enjoy uh, the uh, Fabio talk. Thank you so much, Giovanni. Uh, just before we start, I'm sure that you will enjoy this presentation. It's one of the first uh, uh, statement on basic science, but what's important is that you, it will make you able to understand the implication also for your regular uh, daily uh, la, uh, clinical work. Uh, just to explain a few rules, you have on the screen the question, uh, the Q and A, which is mean a question, and you are able to ask question. During the presentation, Fabio will not answer the uh, question, but at the end of the presentation, we will have some time to uh, answer those questions, and uh, we are here for that. You can uh, send uh, messages through the chat to each other and also to us, and uh, uh, and you will get also a few pull question, which means that we will ask for you for information. Fabio uh, wanted to know from you some information so you will be able to vote and see the results as well. I will stop uh, this part of the presentation so, the, uh, so uh, Fabio will be able immediately to go on with his, uh, his presentation. Fabio, the floor is yours. And, uh, thank you very much. Um, thank you for the invitation. It's an honor and a privilege to, uh, this, uh, to do this webinar. Uh, in the, it's an important topic for me. Uh, I, uh, I would like to start my um, presentation with the questions because it's very important for me to understand the audience that we have. So uh, what do you think, Obi? We can start with the first questions, three on a row. So this is the pool question and you can vote. Please vote on Fabio, you can okay. see the results. Yes, 79% are clinician. Okay, thank you very much. Um, uh, can we go for the other questions, Bobby, please? Of course. Thank you very much. So there's an error in the question. So why do you offer pineal rehabilitation treatments? Based on clinical study, on basic science studies, but I don't offer pineal rehabilitation. But, okay. This is a very interesting. Okay, so I would like to thank you again, um, uh, Kobe and Giovanni and Carlo for the great opportunity uh, uh, to talk about this topic today. And my presentation uh, will be on the uh, clinical animal model for uh, study directed dysfunction of the radical prostatectomy. I made this presentation with the, um, for clinician and not for basic scientists because uh, with the aim to um, uh, to uh, give the clinician the, uh, the possibility to understand the basic uh, animal studies. Okay, um, we cannot talk about animal uh, model for radical prostatectomy without talking about radical prostatectomy and pineal rehabilitation. Everybody knows that radical prostatectomy is now uh, one of the most uh, important and uh, common treatment for localized uh, intermediate and high risk localized prostate cancer. And uh, we know that uh, uh, this um, procedure has a very good oncological outcome. And what happens with our patients after the operation, they start to forget about the operation, the cancer and the level of PSA and start to focus on the um, complication that they have after the operations. Uh, there are two most important complications linked with the radical prostatectomy. The, the first is of course the urinary incontinence, but we know that with the, in the robotic era, this, this, this type of um, complication is quite rare, it's less than, 97% of the patients will recover urinary incontinence in one year, but erectile dysfunction still represents a major challenge because uh, uh, from 20 to 80% of the patients will develop uh, erectile dysfunction. And what is the pathophysiology of uh, um, erectile dysfunction after radical prostatectomy? It looks like obvious, it's a damage of the nerve and then you develop erectile dysfunction, but it's not really true. There are three different theories uh, uh, that, uh, uh, that are not in conflict uh, that uh, um, can influence the development of uh, erectile dysfunction after radical prostatectomy. The first, of course, is the, the damage of the nerve and uh, different kind of nerve damage. Uh, in uh, the bilateral nerve sparing prostatectomy, we call this nerve neuropraxia because there is not anatomical damage of the nerve, but it's a functional one. The other uh, theories is an injury of the accessory pudendal, 
uh, artery, but this kind of uh, uh, trigger for rectal dysfunction is not very well studied and then is the, the scientific evidence are not really clear. And the third one that is emerging in the last five years is the hyperenergic tone of the cavernous uh, uh, tissue after radical prostatectomy as published by the group of Salaman et al. that can influence uh, the uh, genesis of uh, rectal dysfunction. But whatever is the trigger, at the end, we have a fibrosis of the penis. And it's very important uh, um, things to understand that when you develop a fibrosis of the penis, also when uh, the trigger is um, um, independent of the trigger, they will lead to a fibrosis of the penis. And then this stay on the, the first cause is already resolved. Also, when we recover the rectal, the nerve function, the fibrosis can stay in the penis and this can lead to a permanent rectal dysfunction. So when we talk about bilateral nerve sparing, we uh, also talk about a different spectrum of uh, nerve sparing procedure, because if it's embodied, it's involved in the radical prostatectomy, we know we have different grade of uh, nerve sparing. We have intrafascial, uh, interfascial, or extrafascial. This means that when we talk about bilateral nerve sparing, we don't really talk about the quantity of the nerve that we spare. And this is a very important thing that we have to understand before talking about animal model. We also know that people that are aged, like more than 60, has less chance to recover elective functions after radical prostatectomy. So age is a very important uh, factor for recovering erectile function after radical prostatectomy. And we know also that baseline erectile function and comorbidity can influence uh, the recovery erectile function after radical prostatectomy. As you can see in uh, this uh, very nice study by Briganti et al, that showed that low risk patients with good erectile function um, with the uh, um, age less than less than 65 years and low comorbidities have a high, high rate of recovery complete, uh, comparing to the other patients that have comorbidities and worse erectile function. And these are also very important things that we have to understand before talking about animal model. I would like that you have keep in mind when I will explain the animal model. This is a very important study published in 2019. It's a nomogram predicting the rectal function after radical prostatectomy. It's a perioperative nomogram. As you can see, the age and the baseline rectal functions are very important factors in terms of recovery rectal function. The younger you are and better rectal function is prior to the surgery, better are your chance to recover rectal function after radical prostatectomy. And this is another thing that you want to keep in mind when I would talk about animal model. So penile rehabilitation is a old concept of now is 24 years and uh, is like all the treatment that we give to our patient in order to promote erectile function after radical prostatectomy with the intent to improve the rate of recovery. And we know they have different modalities, including pills like PD-5 inhibitor, injections, and vacuum pump. And we know that 80% of the clinicians in Europe and United States use this kind of protocol. And this protocol was invented first by uh, my mentor, Professor Francesco Montorsi from San Raffaele, that uh, in a small study published in 1997, uh, uh, with 27 patients, he tried to inject uh, uh, one group of patients after bilateral nerve sparing with a pro um, prostadil uh, and with a control group of 15 patients. And basing on this study, all the protocol of penile rehabilitations uh, were organized uh, in a similar way. We have first the surgery, then we have the treatment, then we stop the treatment, then we have the washouts, and then we have the evaluation. Since about now 23 years, nothing changed. This is also the protocol that everybody uses uh, for penile rehabilitation. But actually, what we know about penile rehabilitation, penile rehabilitation, we know that it does not function because all the clinical trials, the large clinical trials, so the level one evidence, show that penile rehabilitation does not improve the rate of recovery, but make it faster. And this is a very nice meta-analysis done by my friend Paolo Capogrosso, published in European Urology, that shows in the last decades we have no improvement in the colorectal function patients that undergo to radical prostatectomy. Why? 
because actually there is no treatment to improve the recovery. And then the rectal, uh, the nurse sparing is the most important thing that we can do for our patient to preserve his rectal function. Yeah, so as you can see in this table on the right side, the first two, um, a row, uh, the baseline rectal function and the age are the most important factor for recovering rectal function. And this will be the same for the our animal model I will show you later on. So what we know, we failed with the penile rehabilitations. Uh, does it not improve the rate of recovery, but penile rehabilitation make the uh, rectal function recovery faster. This is what rehabilitation does. But what we really know, based on the uh, level uh, one evidence single trial, we know that penile rehabilitation is also able to preserve penile length, of course, do a faster recovery. We can have uh, multiple modalities, uh, and then when they combine the more than one modality, is better than uh, one modality alone. And it's for select patients, only patients with the nerve sparing procedure. We also know that an early penile rehabilitation is uh, better uh, than late one, and there are um, several publications on this topic. We also recently there is a recent publication that showed that starting the penile rehabilitation before the surgery is even better. Combination therapy is better than monotherapy. And also that uh, patients after bilateral nerve sparing can experience an nocturnal erection. So animal model, we have different animal model for, for investigating the erectile dysfunction after radical prostatectomy. In the literature, we have monkey, dogs, cats, and rabbits, and of course, uh, rats and, and mice. But the rodents are the most common one for different reasons, because they share a lot of biological things uh, and uh, pathways similar to the humans. Of course, the anatomy is very simple. We can easily identify the cavernous nerve near the prostate. If you see in, uh, in, the, in this picture, this is the cavernous nerve and this is the prostate. And the very experienced scientists, uh, they can do a crash of the nerve or in the, visualize the nerve in the rats in 20 minutes. So it's a very easy procedure to find and crash the nerve. And this is the model that is most commonly used uh, for inducing a damage of uh, the nerve, mimicking the nerve sparing uh, surgery. And what we do, we visualize the nerve and we crush with the forceps for a, for a couple of minutes in order to induce a functional damage of the nerve without impairing the anatomy of the nerve itself. And this is the setting that we use for uh, evaluating the uh, rectal function in the rats. What we do, we insert a cannula in the carotid artery of the, of the rats in order to monitor the um, artery pressure. And then we put a needle inside the penis or the crew of the, of, the page, of, the, of the rats. And then we stimulate electrically the nerve. And then we have a response that is called uh, intracavernous pressure. And uh, uh, this is actually the setting that we use for this model. Of course, we can do the damage in a different way. Somebody, they freeze the nerve or there is other technique, but actually they are, um, they are equal. There is a study that show all this technique that we use for make a damage of the nerve um, comparable and uh, have equal effect on the, penilia, on the pineal erection of the rats. This is the first publication that uh, uh, for the model uh, from John Hopkins University. Of course, it's from Patrick Walsh. Uh, is the father of the prostatectomy. And um, you know, on the left, you can see why the, the animal rodent model for uh, uh, radical prostatectomy is useful. Of course, because he, the rats are easy to housing. It's, they are very cheap. The anatomy is uh, quite uh, similar to the to easy to use. And, uh, um, and they share the same biological pathway. But actually what happens in the last 10 years that we have two clinical scenarios. One clinical scenario where the pineal rehabilitation does not function and the other is the laboratory that everything is functioned. As you can see, this is a very good review in sexual medicine review that showed that uh, uh, the paper publicated, um, publicated in the last 10 years uh, using this model. And uh, we can see they use different kind of treatment for, for uh, pineal rehabilitation. In these two studies, they use tracholimus in the other rock inhibitors, and in the other use vacuum pumps, sildenafil, but what is similar from all these studies that they have a very, very good results. And 
when we transfer uh, the, uh, what we have in the, in the laboratory uh, scenario, in the clinical scenario, we always fail. And this is a very nice paper of John Mulal et al. in 2018 that showed that tacrolimus have no effect in recovery rectal function after radical prostatectomy. And this is completely in contrast to what we found in the rats. So what happens with this model is uh, like we transfer what we know about in the human, in the animal model, but we are not able to transfer what we know about in the, what we discover in the uh, animal model to the humans. And this is probably because we don't use in the correct way uh, the animal model or we interpret it not in the correct way the results of the study. So this is the question that always the, uh, I receive, uh, they, make, they make me during the conference. Why did all the basic studies show good results and the clinical study uh, did not show any results, any good results for pneumonia rehabilitation? And with this presentation, I would try to solve this problem. So our ideas for this statement was to standardize, of course, the methods of, uh, uh, of uh, performing uh, um, the animal model for radical prostatectomy in order to compare and facilitate the comparison between the studies. The other is to highlight the pitfall of the model and of course, to help clinicians to understand the study using this model this is uh, most important. This is also the aim of uh, my um, presentation. So this is the first statement of uh, our uh, study is to use um, a guidelines for reporting animal model. So animal, this is uh, um, an international guidelines that is used to improve the reporting of research using animals and is uh, international guidelines and uh, despite is uh, very good and there is a very good checklist that help you in reporting your study and also to plan your study, if you can see in these slides, nobody use. So it's like for meta-analysis, we have the PRISMA guidelines. For animal model, we have some sort of PRISMA guidelines that we call the arrived. And as you can see in the, in the review that we have done for, not for the animal model for radical prostatectomy, but for a Peroni animal model, very few study follow all the recommendation of these guidelines. So this is the first thing that, and uh, the first statement that we did for, uh, in our study. The other statement that we did is like to uh, uniform the methodology and um, it's um, very specific and only the, um, only the uh, scientists that use this kind of model uh, have an interest on that. What we ask is always to uh, measure the intracavernous pressure instead of the corpus spongiosus one because it has less bias. We all, the world, or we, all uh, we ask it to uh, always normalize the cavernous pressures with the artery pressure and of course to offer a detailed description of the methods uh, but this of course are uh, how we want that uh, uh, the results uh, to be showed and we want the graph of the uh, of the registrations including the mean arterial pressure and also we want the, like that the needle is in the corpora uh, cavernosa and not in the corpora spongiosa because this can influence the measurements of the pressure. Uh, also, we would like to standardize the way that we um, electrically stimulate the nerve and then, of course, all the scientists can use their own parameter, but we will try to um, uh, make a recommendation on this in order to have a comparison between studies is also very difficult because one study uses a different hertz or different voltage and, and sometimes it's very difficult to understand if they obtain a maximal uh, erection in the rats. And this is what we uh, ask to do and these are very specific parameters that you can read in the publication but I don't think it's very interesting in, uh, for a, a clinical audience. And this is the, uh, exactly the model we use. And then on the left side, uh, you can see the machine that we use for electro stimulation of the rats with the parameter that uh, uh, we recommend. Now, the most important statement uh, um, of, uh, uh, of our study that uh, um, actually show the pitfall of the animal model. First, the author should clearly report if a unilateral or bilateral nerve crash is performed. Uh, 
And uh, if you do proximal or distal to the point of nerve damage, why we ask this? So actually, when we perform a crash of the cavernous nerve bilaterally, usually with the, with the, this is with the recommend, we only crash 50% of the nerve that go to the penis because there are extra nerves called ancillary nerves that is uh, already shown by Sato Toll in this uh, very important publication in 2001 that are not crushed during, are not damaged during the uh, crash of the cavernous nerve in, in the rats. This means that when we do the model and we do the crash, we only damage only 50% of the nerves and 50% stay intact. And this is like performing a perfect bilateral nerve sparing surgery with the preservation of the veil of Aphrodite. It's like uh, the nerve that you have on top of the prostate go to the nerves. And it's a publication that published in European Urology in 2006. And then it's an approach, a United, an American approach for radical prostatectomy. And as you can understand, one of the limits of the animal model that we have, that always you have the best surgeon because the learning curve for crushing the nerve is very small. And then the people that experience that can do the operation in 20 minutes is skin to skin. We have a, a perfect nerve sparing technique. And of course, we have a very good anatomy because always there are young rats with no comorbidities, with no surgery before, and they're easy to crush the nerve. And this represents a good point to understand why uh, uh, everything is functioning in the rats. The other statements regarding uh, the limitation of the study, um, we described the two important uh, uh, limitations that I will explain further in this presentation. The first, that the rats have no comorbidities. And this is unlike what happens uh, in the clinical setting. And the other that we not consider the spontaneous recovery of the rats that usually happens after six months. And we ask the author to always remember in the discussion this important limitation because we help the clinician, the clinician to understand the limits of the model and to better interpret uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, results of the study itself. But Go back again to the benefit of uh, pineal rehabilitation. We know that it preserves the pineal length. There is a faster recovery, multimodal motility, and for select patients. We also know that early rehabilitation or perioperative rehabilitation is better than late one. The combination of therapy is better than monotherapy, and uh, the, the patients have nocturnal erections after bilateral nerve sparing. What, which are the most important limits of the study that use this animal model for radical prostatectomy? First one is the age of the rats, and I will explain to you later. The time frame of the treatment and evaluation. And again, we can go for the age. We know that people that are older than 60 have less chance to recover erectile function after radical prostatectomy. So people young than 60, like 40 to 50 or 30 to 40, have a better recovery than older men. And this is quite obviously, uh, obvious, sorry. And this is the same of the rats. Old rats, like 22 to 24 months, have uh, um, normal rats, though without any operations, but old rats have uh, worse erectile function than young rats aged three months. And this is clearly shown by this study published in 2012. So age also affects the erectile function of the rats. But what we do, what, which kind of uh, rats we use in the animal study already published, we always use young rats. It means we use rats that have six to 12 months. It means uh, compared to the human age that they have 18 to 30 years old. So this is quite strange because actually we have to use, or we actually, if you think about this, we have to use older animals because the patient, are, our patient, the clinical scenario always between 60 and 75. But in, uh, in the animal study, we always use young rats and there's between 18 to 30. More important, we start the pineal rehabilitation after one, two months uh, from the operation because the patient has to recover, has no erectile function, has no, um, he doesn't want to have sex. And we usually, as you can see in the REACT study, start the um, treatment 14 to two months after the operation. And 
we know that an early rehabilitation is better than a later rehabilitation. So a pa uh, patient that starts the treatment uh, uh, between two months from the operation have a better result than the people the, the, of the patient that starts the rehabilitation after two months. So also we know from the basic science study that the most important damage that uh, occur after radical prostatectomy in terms of uh, expression of inflammatory markers and damage of the nerves occur immediately, so after one day to seven days from the operations. So this is clear that if you want to prevent the damage or if you want to prevent an injury on the penis, on the nets, we have to start the treatment immediately after the surgery. And this is what the scientists have perfectly understood. And this is the reason why we start always in the animal study, the, uh, the treatment at the same day or the day after uh, uh, the operation. This is an important study on Martin Albertson et al. Uh, investigating um, trachronimus that showed that uh, they start the treatment the same day of the crash. And if you can look, 90, more than 90% uh, more than of the paper of uh, uh, publishing with using this animal model, they start the treatment at day zero. And a few study all start the treatment after day one. Also, in all the clinical trial, there is a, a washout periods. And this is very important because actually to understand if there is a real recovery of erectal, spontaneous erectile function or not. And as you can see in the RAC study, if we evaluate the rectal function before the washout, there is a very good response of people that receive Tadalafil every day comparing to the placebo group. But when the washout is finished, so after one year, at three months from the washout, there is no any more the difference. So actually, in the rats, we only give uh, maximum three days of washout, and a lot of study does not give a washout at all. And this can be also a bias of the uh, animal study because uh, uh, the medication, the treatment is still in the body of, uh, of the rats, and sometimes uh, it can affect the results after that. More important, we know that uh, recovery erectile function is a, a time process. It means that uh, people still recover after 12, 24 months. And now there are studies that show that the um, patient can recover erectile function also from uh, four years from the operation. And this is a very important thing. So there is a gradually recovery by the time. But there is the same with the rats. So if we see in the RAC study, uh, there is a time a recovery rectal function, both for the placebo group, for Tadalafil, PRN, and then for Tadalafil on demand. And uh, at the end of the uh, washout period, so in the open label phase, there is no difference between the two groups. Uh, more important, um, if we look in the uh, treatment that we do, we usually do a treatment for 28 days, so it means four weeks. And this is a very important thing that we have to understand. Why we all the study usually give the treatment for one month and the evaluation is about uh, uh, three days later after the, the treatment? Because there is a general agreement that uh, one month of uh, um, rat life is equivalent, equivalent to a uh, two years of uh, uh, human life. But how we can decide this. Actually, this concept is strange, but came from very old publications that uh, try to uh, uh, compare the two lifespan of the, uh, the rats and the human. It is basing on the layers in the tibia, musculoskeletal growth, grow, and, and uh, thickening of the epiphysis, but nobody compared the nerve regeneration of the rectal function recovery between men and rats. And what we know, and if you think about that, this is a very important concept because if one month is true, one month of uh, animal uh, life is equi equivalent to two years of uh, uh, human life, all the clinical study has to, uh, has to provide the treatment for two years and not only for six months as usually we provide. And more important, if it is false, we have to consider that probably the rats can have a recovery, a spontaneous recovery of the erectile function. And 
these are the main two questions. Uh, this, uh, the, this time frame does not consider the time of uh, erectile function recovery after, after radical prostatectomy. And in the clinical setting, the treatment should be performance for two years at least, if you want to uh, follow the animal uh, basic science study. But does the rat recover erectile function after bilateral nerve crash injury? The answer is yes, they recover. They recover after six months. So the, all, if you operate a rat and do a crash injury, the rats recover in the normal erection like before after six months. So, and no of the study uh, published um, in the literature uh, treat the rats for six months or evaluate the rats after six months from the uh, crash injury. So in this, if you think about that also, we always operate animals that have no comorbidities, and this is not the clinical scenario we have in the clinical setting. So all our patients have some comorbidities or they are old. And this is the reason why probably all the rats have a good erectile function after radical prostatectomy and then the treatment, they make it fast. So we always operate all a person in the clinical setting, but we operate young and without comorbidities rats in the uh, lab scenario. So if you think about that, the scientific uh, um, study basing on the animal model and the clinical trial, uh, uh, they say the same thing exactly. There is a faster recovery but there is not an improved rate of recovery because no of the study or the basic animal study uh, investigate the spontaneous recovery of erectile function because they evaluate the erectile function only after one month. It means that they don't take enough time to see if there is a spontaneous recovery like the clinical trial does. This is the reason why I think both clinical and basic science studies say the same thing. There is a faster recovery with the, rectal, with the pineal rehabilitation, but there is no improvement in terms of uh, rate of recovery. So uh, what happens in the lab scenario? We have always the best surgeon. We have the perfect nerve sparing technique, a perfect anatomy. We have uh, early treatment and evaluations, not considering the uh, spontaneous recovery of the rats. We have uh, young patients, the, the rats without comorbidity, and we have no sometimes washout periods. So if you think why everything, everything function in the rats and not the human, probably now you understand why. So thank you. And there are any questions? Thank you so much, Fabio, for uh, this uh, excellent explanation and making it uh, very clear for the clinician uh, to understand first the models and second, the, the difference in the results and how to interpret the study results for the clinical uh, way. Um, if there are questions from the audience, please write them on the Q&A. I see at this moment one uh, question, which is actually not directly related to the topic. We get, you get immediately a compliment of very good and clear explanation, but the question is related to cryotherapy. And it said, um, what is, how is with the penal function in the case of cryotherapy versus classic radical prostatectomy? Do you want to answer it, uh, Fabio or Carlo? It's or? Not it's not quite in the topic webinar, but pineal function and the cryotherapy. So actually for the cryotherapy, actually it's a different concept because cryotherapy is only for um, localized uh, uh, cancer and you always do um, cryoablation of uh, the part of the prostates. And the treatment still is about 20 minutes to do and you can probably damage one part of the nerves and not the other. Yes. Uh, the answer is this. It's a little bit, uh, I, I try to be as, as clear as I can. So imagine that the penis has a compliance, okay? Yeah, and this compliance uh, is uh, make you allowed to have a good erection. Imagine that you have several damages on the penis, like by the age or comorbidities and other factors, and your, the so your penis starts to become less and less productive so with less, more and more fibrosis. But the fibrosis is not uh, enough to, to block the erection. Imagine that in your penis you have 50% uh, of fibrosis. 
and after 60%, you cannot have any erections anymore. If you do a clear ablation in a patient that has 50% of fibrosis of his penis, the clear ablation will give a 10% and then it becomes important, okay? But it's very rare to have 50%. You have to vary a lot of comorbidities and other things. If you have a young patient or patients without comorbidity, he has 30% of the uh, fibrosis of compliance. And if you add another 10, does not make any difference. This continues to have an erection. This is the reason why clear ablation is better than radical prostatectomy in terms of recovery erectile function. But radical prostatectomy, nerve sparing, whatever it is, giving 30% of fibrosis. So a patient that is quite good in erection and with few comorbidities by aged, has already a 40% of his uh, penis fibrotic. And then if you add 30%, even for develop erectile dysfunction. Also when the nerves start to function again, because when the fibrosis is done, it's not possible to go back. It's not really true, but actually this is the sense of uh, my, my interpretation of uh, why somebody can get an erection after radical prostatectomy or not. Thank you, uh, Fabio. Another question. Um, uh, by the way, we don't have uh, good studies on cryotherapy in general and yeah. erectile function afterward. And one of the reasons is that the majority of the indication for cryotherapy is a salvage therapy, which yeah. our patient after a uh, radiotherapy, uh, et cetera. Yeah. So that's yeah. one of the explanation. Yeah. One. So the results are bad. Uh, another question, are intercavernous placebo controlled trial, uh, are intercavernous placebo controlled trial in human? I mean, are, do, do they exist? I'm, what, what, sorry, what, what, what is the question? The question, are, are, inter, are intercavernous placebo controlled trial in human? That uh, yeah. probably yeah. an injection. You yeah, there are. The yeah. first one is Montorsio et al. There is a recent one uh, by Mulal et al. That Mulal also have a very good rehabilitation project, uh, program that involves multimodal therapy. Uh, uh, it looks like that the injection of function um, have a better result than oral therapy, but there is no large clinical trial to have a level one evidence. The, the, first, uh, the first studies on the penile rehabilitation started... 1997. In, exactly. So that's. Uh, can we replace immunohistochemical staining for NOS with uh, measuring ICP in erectile evaluation? What is your meaning on, um, opinion on that, Fabio? So no, actually, uh, it's a bit. Um, this enos is like a parameter that says if the uh, NOS mechanism is function or not, how much enos is there or not. But all the data we we never can skip the functional or the histology in the rats because it's a term that uh, tell us how much is the damage of the penis and is very important for understanding if there is a recovery of the nerve function or not. So we always suggest to perform an histology of the penis and depending of course of the study or what you are studying, you can use an OS if you are studying PD-5 inhibitors or you study the bad and you see if there is a more regeneration. But Basic signs tell other things about erection or non erection, and that is why it's very useful to understand. I think no, it's, the answer is no from my point of view. I totally agree. There is a question about do you recommend a prostadil for a post radical prostatectomy ED? The patient has problem with vacuum and PD5 not work uh, for him enough. Uh, do you want to answer, or for, uh, I can yeah. answer, or Carlo? Uh, oh, whatever. I, my own, uh, uh, let's say you certainly can, because there are also studies on the use of, uh, of uh, intercavernal injection uh, in, a, uh, in a rehabilitation uh, protocol. And actually I'm even using sometimes the tree mix that are not commercially available as part of the rehabilitation protocol with the once a week and in between also PD-5 in combination. Carlo, do you want to say something about yeah, it? Yeah, I think that uh, Fabio gave a very good uh, answer on this uh, question during uh, the beginning of his presentation, that probably as much as you can play with all the possible tools, uh, as better you can have a good result. So I, I do agree that uh, you're right that you can use a prostadil or the trimix, but uh, if you try to use a combination of tools, uh, maybe you can even have better results. So I, I do agree with uh, Fabio's presentation. Yeah. Uh, if I can answer... 
Yeah, yes. go ahead, Fabio. If ahead. I can have an answer, it's the endpoint that you want to reach. Okay, they have no good response with the PD5 inhibitor and the VAD. I always suggest to my patient to use a multimodal because actually, if you VAD regularly, I use PD5 in the night, so that can be sildenafil 25 milligram or chalice 5 milligram, whatever you uh, make a therapy for your penis to reduce fibrosis, especially immediately post-op. I prefer to start before the operation, this is my opinion, because I make the penis healthy before the trauma. It's like, you know, you have, will have a trauma, you go to the, in the leg, you go to the gym to make your muscle strength before the trauma itself, you know, you have faster recovery. But it's not about only to get an erection for penetration, it's about to make your penis survive from the fibrosis that will generate. So if you use regularly VED and PD-5 inhibitor, you can prevent the fibrosis. So it's not only penetration, it's only biological mechanism involved in this. Totally agree. Next Just question. Wow. Just sorry, one brief sorry. comment, sorry, Kobe. Uh, I think that the major problem for penile rehabilitation after radical prostatectomy is the urologist. I think we are the problem because the, the vast majority of us has no idea, no interest in this problem. And so they just, they just think about taking out the prostate and then start to prepare the afterwards uh, follow-up of the patient. But uh, they are not really very much focused on that. So I think we are the problem. <laughs> Yeah, I totally agree, Carlo, and it's connected to the next question we ask, do you see a role of psychosexual therapy as part of penile rehabilitation? Again, what you said, multimodal, if the patient is in fear and you don't know, and certainly he's going to face in the beginning failure, you need to prepare it because otherwise the performance anxiety and adrenaline will be so high that no performance is possible. So you need to combine all the aspects and, and, and uh, the need of the couple as well when they need it. The penile rehabilitation is technical issue, medical issue, and facing the sexuality is the other issue that need to be involved. I think that you both agree. But if you think about uh, the questionnaire we go, the IFF, is if you do before the biopsy or after the biopsy, it's not valid because the patient is stressed. So we know this is already published that if you do an IVF before uh, all the process is better when you start to know about prostate cancer. Prostate cancer for sure affects the sexual function, affects the level of adrenergic system in your penis. And if you are stressed, you don't want to have sex, is the sex is the most important rewards for sex you always impair your sexual function. And this is why I always suggest to, if they need, go to psychologists, but it's not still available everywhere. And, and that this, I think we have to implement this kind of figure in our pathway of opinion rehabilitation. Yes, totally agree. Uh, is the same damage if you do localized eye food therapy? Uh, so what, what do you mean the same damage? Actually, uh, now, if you are aware about radical prostatectomy, so I have the chance to do two years of fellowship and then so I do myself. So I'm, I'm, no, I'm not only a scientist, I was a clinician. When you do a radical prostatectomy, you take the nerves, you stretch the nerve, you go there, sometimes you burn because it's bleeding. With the IFU, it's always localized enough through the gland. And then you always can damage part of the nerve, but not all. So the level of damage that you have on the nerve with IFU is less, of course. Then depends on how the, this damage uh, can, uh, how the patient react to this damage, because it's a patient already with a lot of comorbidities and stuff. A small damage can create impotence as well. So I always suggest to do penile rehabilitation or may or better, a sexual preservation to all the patients this is what I call penile rehabilitation because I, the end point is a little bit different. But of course, you have always tried to avoid any damage of the penis and any fibrosis because always when the nerves recovery and the fibrosis is there, it's very difficult to remove fibrosis. And this is my um, topic, fibrosis of the penis. And I did my PhD on that. It's very, very difficult to remove the fibrosis from the penis. Totally agree. Maybe the mechanism of the damage by IFU is different because it could be yeah. vascular because of the warmth. Yeah. But yeah, the end different. results on the penis is the same, but the mechanism yeah. going there it could be different. Yeah. yeah. We don't know. Yeah. And another question. Many papers do not state whether they stimulate the right or left cavernous nerve. When studies mention that they measure ICP, 
MAP with bilateral stimulation, they do not say how they use that data. Do you recommend averaging ICP slash MAP on the right and the left side, or should they be viewed as separate data points, biological uh, duplicates, or should the researcher only use the side with the best ICP waveform? So, actually, of course, it's uh, my opinion. There is no data and there is no study. So, actually, we know if you do a bilateral stimulation, it's better than unilateral. This is already proved uh, by uh, the first study of uh, Walsh. So, bilateral stimulation is better than single stimulation. What we do in the normal setting, we crush both nerves and then we stimulate one because stimulating two nerves is more difficult. It's not easy and they can affect the protocol because you can take more time and then you can have an aesthetic problem with the rats and other things. So I have no any preference in right or left and this is something new to me and then thank you, maybe we'll think about that. But I don't think that is a real matter is stimulating right one or left one. It's, uh, because you always do a curve of stimulation for the same nerve. So actually, no, from my point of view, it's not really a matter, but maybe easy if somebody do a study prove that. Thank you, Fabio. There is a, a question about uh, cost effectiveness of uh, penal rehabilitation comparing to treatment on demand. Uh, I'm not aware on data on it. So, um, of course, uh, if you, there are, there are data on this, they say that the rehabilitation has a cost that is more than uh, uh, PNR, but actually I'm strong believe that penile rehabilitation can have an effect for select patients. It's not for everyone. And this is the reason why in our uh, institution, we are creating a, a protocol uh, according to the risk of the patient developing function, this difference. Um, uh, if you have uh, used the standard protocol, like uh, starting the chalice or whatever it is uh, after one month or two months, it's only to make it faster. But so for me, it's like giving, there is no difference. I always suggest to do the giving on demand. If you have a structured protocol with a biological and clinical aim, I always suggest to spend a little bit of money on that. But yes, PNR is le uh, cost less than uh, penile rehabilitation protocol. But for, for these patients, after radical prostatectomy, they survive from a cancer. They will forget about prostate cancer. They will forget about PSA. The only thing that will ask you, and uh, I work in a very good center, in an andrology center, that we see more than 700 patients every year with this kind of things. The only things about having sex and probably before the surgery, they have no sex at all. After that, they become very, it's, they like reborn. A sex is reborn and they want to have sex. And then this is a very important factor that influence their life. So I agree to spend money on this. I think Fabio, they, they forget about sex when they know they have a tumor. But then yeah. once they get out the tumor, they forget yeah. about the tumor and they yeah. forget about sex. They forget so they about PSA. PSA. And yeah. And they develop. And, and, uh, and you know I, what I'm saying to the colorectal surgeon: you maybe take the tumor out, out, but we give the patient a smile. Yeah, but this is something that we, because actually, a few patients now go for radiotherapy because we take with the PSA area a lot of intermediate risk and low risk. But the thing is, you have an, a huge uh, with the robotic hair and now with the new robots, the radical prostatectomy can go the eye because now we do also high risk localized prostate cancer. And 10 years ago, nobody will touch an high risk localized prostate cancer. And now everybody. So you have to think that this is a problem. This is linked with prostate cancer. It's the most important disease, cancer disease in men. So it means they are extremely linked. We are equally useful for these patients because Oncology, we see for two months, then the operation will go away and then they don't see anymore. And then for two years, we stay with us, with the andrologist, asking why my penis become bent now, before it was normal. I explained, this is the fibrosis of the penis. They develop peroneal disease. The vacuum does not function properly. And they, they have pain during the erection. All these kinds of things are very important. They are focused on that. And they came and pay a lot of money for that. And they buy whatever they want for this, more than they spend for treating the cancer sometimes. 
this is my opinion and this is what I see, but maybe I'm wrong. No, you're not wrong. This is the reality because uh, cancer sometimes change people's life and mind and they want to get whatever possible when they are alive again. And it's happened a lot. Yeah. Yeah, yeah of course. Certainly. And the last question that I see is, is about in the UK, clinically, we find one of the major barriers to offering penal rehabilitation over a two-year period is financial reliance on GP cooperation as they are predominantly the gatekeepers for patient access to treatment. Are they, there any studies involving GPs in penal rehabilitation strategies? No, but thank you, because I live in UK and I understand exactly the problem. And this is a very good point that I will, uh, I will do as mine, because I am writing something like that. The problem with, I for somebody that is not from UK, the problem is uh, UK that after a patient is operated, then uh, we can prescribe this, the initial treatment and then GPS to continue to prescribe. The problem is that child is very expensive and uh, uh, especially the one, uh, one, um, the everyday dosage and then uh, the GP that one does not prescribe because it's not really in the BNF that is in our pharmaceutical guidance. The problem is exactly that um, we don't take probably into account GP in doing this, but if uh, one of big institution of UK start to do a protocol and is become accepted by NHS everywhere, they cannot refuse to give the, the medication that we, we give. Of course, including the GP in the system is good, but they are, uh, the money that they have to spend is high and they don't want to spend money. But in GP, in UK is also strange because if uh, a patient go to uh, non-nest spending radical prostatectomy and you tell it to the patient, okay, there is no reason that you start PD-5 inhibitor, but you had to start with the injection. Some GP, you know what they say? No, you have to start first the oral therapy. If it does not respond, you go for injections. So this what, is what, what is it? What, what, because in the BNF, they're written they have to start, they have to fail first the oral yeah. therapy. But uh, this is not sense. So why do I have to use PD-5 in a patient that has no nerves? This is because it gave you a good idea to work on uh, some new project involving the GPs. GPs. Yeah, it's yeah. very, very good. It's very good because, yeah. Because, because they are no better. Yeah, but this is because the GPs are uh, educated to think in protocols. They cannot know uh, everything about. No, all this the is. Things. I'm not. I'm not criticizing yeah. GP. This is a lack of communication with exactly. us and GP because it never involved the GP in what we do. And then, of course, I don't know anything of us vascular surgery too. But the, the the barrier that we have, the wall, is because there is lack of communication on what's going between us and the GP. And I've seen a lot of uh, also urologists continues to prescribe PD-5 inhibitor to patients with a non pain surgery. And sometimes there is a barrier between andrologists and urologists itself because there are, andrologists are always the field of urologists that is not really like the oncologist one. But we know a lot of things because we know a lot, we follow a lot of patients. One thing, you know, the other. So all the patients after radical prostatectomy has a little bit of incontinence, but there are patients that are fully are full erections after the, the procedure. The main problem with these patients is uh, leaking urine during the sexual intercourse. And for this reason, they don't use any medications. A simple thing to tell the patient is using an elastic band to put during the erection, blocking the urethra, and they can have a normal sexual intercourse. But actually, this kind of things, nobody knows a part of the andrologist that with the, with the bed and the stuff like that. And when you just show to the patients, oh, look the band, and now not leaking anymore. You change the life of the patient with one elastic band. You understand what I mean? There's a lack of communication. Exactly. Uh, it's the same problem in the Netherlands. It's almost everywhere. Yeah. And, and with the band, they have even better reaction. So in another... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. That is anyway, something. thank you so much, Fabio. For thank you, this, Fabio. Uh, great, thank you very uh, much. Uh, this excellent presentation. Uh, just before we uh, closing this um, marvelous webinar that uh, uh, Fabio gave us, I would like to uh, uh, again thank Fabio for making it very clear for the clinician and to understand all the difference in the models and the difference in the results, but also the implication to the clinical practice as well. Uh, 
ESS service, you know, have a lot of activities and, uh, and please follow us in our website, ESSM.org and follow our newsletters concerning the upcoming congresses, the upcoming webinars. I know that uh, there are some plans to have uh, other webinars in the near futures. So keep updated about all those uh, developments. And uh, next week, we have another webinar with uh, uh, Javier Romero Otero from Spain and Leo Lewinstein from Israel about energy-based devices for female genital urinary indication are they placed in the clinical practice or in studies? What kind of indication, how to work with those things and how to interpret the results that we have nowadays. Uh, so join us on the 24th of June for another interesting webinar on that respect. And thank you for being with us. Don't forget to fill in the feedback uh, questionnaires with only a few questions at the end of this webinar to let us know what you think about what subject you want and how we can do even better in the uh, near future. So thank you again, Fabio. Thank you, Carlo. Thank you, Giovanni. And thank, thank you, you the audience. And have a nice evening wherever you are. Thank you, you very are. much. Thank you.